个首先非常感谢各位嘉宾能够起了一个大早来参加我们这一次的研讨会。我们实际上十月初才刚办完一个，呃，今天我们又很荣幸能够邀请到呃远从这个爱沙尼亚来的 Professor w o l f d r e t c h e s l e r o k d r e t c h e s l e r 远道而来，然后为我们发表一,一场演讲，然后接下来会有一场圆圆桌论坛。我们也很荣幸邀请到校外的嘉宾，我们非常欢迎。Professor d r e t c h e s l e r 再度哦光临本系哦造访本系，然后能够再来帮我们做这一场演讲。那接下来呢，就为了今天这一场的研讨会，我就制作了一个开场的投影片。This animation PowerPoint made by myself. Yeah, for uh, thank you and welcome. OK， 那接下来我们就请那个 Professor 来帮我们做演讲。Thank you very much for coming once again. And now I'd like to invite Professor Jaxler to、uh, deliver his talk and his speech. Thank you. So, ladies and gentlemen, it's a great honor, pleasure, and privilege to be here today.、Um, there is very few formats. That are as interesting for an academic to have discussions with with one's colleagues and、uh, have a real interplay. I think this is a wonderful format. So, I have very fond memories of the conference last year,、uh, which was very nice. Actually, I was I was just landing two hours before the conference started, <laughs> and it was quite intensive to talk about it and then right away get into the discussion with Professor Berman because, as you might know. On various issues in public management, if this is the spectrum of opinions, Professor Berman is here and I am there. So, in that sense, it's very interesting because between the two of us, you get the possible spectrum of views in public administration.、Um, Professor Berman, for instance, thinks there is no context, and I think there is almost only context. I don't think global public administration exists. He sure does. But the the irony is, as you. As we just mentioned, Pro Professor Berman left the National Chengchi University and is now at the University、uh, at Victoria University in Wellington, New Zealand. And two months after he went there, I actually was asked whether I want to be the new dean of that school. So I would have turned into his boss, which is which would have been really a very interesting way. But actually, on a personal level, we get along with no problems whatsoever, and we have a very friendly, scholarly discourse. We know where we disagree, and on the personal level, we are we are can we can do this very well. Anyway, so.、Um, I only have 40 minutes, so until 12 now, as it is, and so. Because of what I just mentioned, and because you're all experts in the subject matter, I don't have to tell you the basics of the new public management. I will sharpen my points. I will not say maybe and perhaps and on the other hand, but I will straightly put、um, how I see this perspective to be. And so this is、um, one of the most interesting and controversial questions right now in public administration: is whether we have one global discipline of PA that is everywhere the same, or we, whether we have different paradigms. However, no matter how you answer the debate, functionally speaking, that means in the world of science and also the world of public administration implementation, we do have global PA. That means there is, even although there are delays, and even although people in different countries react differently and in different cultures,、um, the the idea of genuine paradigms of public administration is only emerging. So we have a global culture, global journals, global trends. Whether it's correct or not, never mind. But it's there, and、um, on this one. It is, in a very sweeping way, fair to say that the time from the end of World War II about until the mid 1970s was, in the main trailblazing nations of the West, that means largely Northern America and Europe, coined by what you call Weberian administration. Weberian administration, named after the leading 
PA scholar at all of all times, Max Weber, whose 150th birthday we celebrate next year, um, specifically refers to continental Europe, but we used the term Weberian administration to talk about all public administration in a traditional, hierarchical, and soon it came to mean boring style, taking a lot of tax resources, redistributing. It was associated with Keynesian economics and the growth of the public sector and so on. So in the 1970s, the ideology in the West changed into a neoliberal camp. This is when you had in the early 1980s the rise of Thatcher and Reagan. And um, there was a strong criticism about spending too much money. There wasn't also so much money anymore. And to this, pretty much in the year 1980, emerged the new public management idea, new as compared to the old, the old being Weberian, and Weberian being a label used also to the non-Weberian countries, such as Anglo-America, which is very important in this point. To remind, so Max Weber, the leading thinker on bureaucracy, Weberian administration is not what he liked, but what he thought was um, the key for his time. Very briefly put, for Weber, the most effective PA was a set of offices in which appointed civil servants operated under the principles of merit selection, that means impersonality, hierarchy, the division of labor, exclusive employment, career advancement, the written form and legality. This increase of rationality, which is Weber's key term, would increase speed, scope, predictability, and cost effectiveness as needed for a mass industrial society. So, Weber doesn't say it's good administration. He says at that point in history, when we have mass industrial society, this is the best working PA. This is what Weber really says, but we use the label to refer to traditional, hierarchical, not very well working PA. The new public management, a lot of people today say you can't really define it, or there are various views. That is not correct. New public management can very easily be defined as the transfer of business principles and management techniques from the private into the public sector. So new public management is nothing else but taking the insight from the economics departments and the business schools and treating the state as a large enterprise. That and nothing else is the new public management. I go with economic tools to the state, which I understand as a firm, and analyze it according to that in order to reap efficiency gains that we have in the private sector because of competition in the public sector as well. And it totally fit the mood of the 1980s where the business was so cool and everything should be according to that and the state was seen as a hindrance. That means, of course, that the new public management is a genuine ideology, it is, or it's based on a genuine ideology, namely the neoliberal concept of state and economy. Economy good, state bad. That is a view. That is an ideological view. You cannot say one or two is correct, just as today not. Whether you believe in the free market or well, very well working states, that's a matter of choice. But it's not different than the difference between being a Buddhist and a Christian. You believe it or you don't, but you can't prove it. Um, today, that's easier said than the 1980s because, as you know, some of the most successful countries are strong state countries today. The biggest enterprises in the world are state-owned enterprises in mainland China, banks. So, second, the new public management is very standardized and quantifying, relying on hard data. It's not about feeling good, but it's about demonstrating by the point of what's correct or not. That turned out to be a big problem for the new public management because it means you can disprove things if the numbers are not correct. The goal is a minimal state. Therefore, as many state activities as possible were outsourced. And the key principle was the principle of efficiency. That is the big word for it. The catchphrases, that means the phrases where you can always tell that we're talking about NPM, are project management, flat hierarchies, customer orientation, abolition of career civil service, depolitization, total quality management, contracting out, and performance pay. Now, if you see the slide, many people in a lot of countries would say, that's not bad, that's actually nice. 
And that hasn't changed that this is nice. The question is only, does it work? The problem of the new public management is that it promised a state that costs less and delivers more, but what it did is to create a state that costs more and delivers less. In reality and by the standards of the NPM, that's important. So in European PA theory, and I say theory, not practice, since 1995, and again I say Europe rather than Australasia and North America, uh, the timeline was that in 1995 it was still possible to believe in NPM, although there were first strong and substantive critiques. In 2000, NPM was on the defense. Empirical findings spoke clearly against it. And in 2005, so almost 10 years ago, NPM was not a viable concept anymore. NPM, in that sense, is a historical paradigm of public administration, not a current one, and what then emerged there was a debate about post-NPM, the time in which we are. There are very few people in our discipline who would not argue that we're in a post-NPM time. This is the standard assumption right now. And there are various names, network governance, neo barbarian state, new public governance, value governance, joint up governance, whole of government approach. All of these terms that you've all heard about are attempts to name the time after the death of NPM. But what then happened in 2008, in the fall, was the global financial crisis, which totally impacted PA as a priority and brought NPM back. So by the summer of 2008, NPM was dead. And by the fall of 2008, it was back. Because the point of NPM is not transparency or citizen inclusion. The point of NPM is cutting money. And if you have a crisis, what you want is to cut money no matter what. That is why NPM ideologically came back as the largest research project on that topic called COCOPS, a large research project of the European Union has shown actually we don't, we have not been going back to NPM practices, but people and politicians say we are partially going back to NPM practices because it sounds good during the crisis. But we have to go before the crisis because we want to talk about what was wrong with NPM to begin with. That means, why didn't it work? First of all, of course, it never understood the difference between the state and the private sector. NPM basically assumes that the state is a giant Kentucky Fried Chicken. But it's not, partially because Kentucky Fried customers pay and then get something. But the citizens don't pay. They own the place. They are stakeholders in the private business. You call that shareholders. NPM always says the citizen as a customer. But as James Q. Wilson already said in 1992, the, the, citi uh, um, the citizen is not less than a customer, but more than a customer, because he owns the place. Private business about profit. If a state is about profit, we are talking about a criminal state. There are some dictatorships that are run by their bosses. We, we recently had a state that behaved like that towards Taiwan, the Gambia, because that is run by a guy who runs his country for his personal profit. And if you don't give him the money, he breaks the relations and goes with whomever else in order to get more money to buy another golden bathtub. These are criminal states. And there you can tell the difference. If states behave like business, they are criminal. If businesses go for profit, they have to. They have an obligation towards their shareholders and owners. There's nothing bad with Kentucky Fried. Kentucky Fried Chicken doesn't sell chicken in order to make the world happy, but in order to make money. And that's good, but in the state level, it's not. So very often, the most basic requirements and advantages of the state were mistaken for a liability, meaning Business decides fast, the state took so long, and you can challenge it in the law and everything like that. But that's a good thing. We don't want quick democracy. We need the checks, the talk, the discourse, and so on, because the state has a power monopoly. There is a misdefinition of efficiency. Efficiency in NPM very often means cheap. I pay little. But efficiency doesn't mean cheap, because if efficiency would mean cheap, we would use the word cheap, but we don't. We use the word efficient, so it must mean something else. Efficient is an economic term, 
And it means with a minimum input of resources, you get a certain defined goal, which in the state is usually bigger than it is in the private sector. So state efficiency and business efficiency are different. I will get in the end to that one of the most surprising things in the early debate about NPM is that the people who were opposed to NPM said, okay, it's business efficient cheaper, but we lose too much democracy and citizen participation. Today, we say, even by business efficiency, NPM was a failure. I will get to the citation in the end, but ladies and gentlemen, in the end, we can say that in almost all countries, privatization, contracting out, and public-private partnerships cost more money. NPM did not save from the beginning on. And that is not an ideology question that you can show or not. It's a matter of bookkeeping. So this is very important. It's not based on genuine economics. I don't know how uh, how familiar you are with this, that very often in NPM you have profit centers and agencies contracting with each other, so you play business. But as Klaus Koenig, the most important German PA scholar, has said, these are quasi-markets, and quasi-markets are pseudo-markets, and pseudo-markets are not markets. Market effects you have in the market, but if you have one customer and one supplier, and they have to contract, you don't have a market. You are like little children playing in the sand, shopkeeper. Hi, I want to buy this. Okay, here you go. This is a nice play, but it's not a market. You have market advantages in markets, but not outside. And there is an unspecific view of the human person. NPM is based on the neoclassical economic view that people can be motivated by money. You give them more money, bonuses, incentives, performance pay, and they work better. We know since a very good while that this is not how people operate. Many people are more interested in prestige, and some people are more interested in leisure than there are in money. You can't incentivize them. I'll get to an example very soon. Or actually, I get to the example now. The leading scholar in public sector motivation, well, this is Jim Perry, the editor of PAR, but the leading expert on motivation at all in the world is the American economist George Akerlof. Akerlof um, was president of the American Economics Association and he won the Nobel Prize in economics for this work. So he has the highest credits you can possibly have. Professor of economics at University of California at Berkeley. And he wrote a series of articles on motivation. He coined the concept of motivational capital, saying that good firms, after the physical capital, the human capital, and the contractual capital, that means the legal relations they have, have as a fourth thing motivational capital about the retention of good employees. Because contrary to the NPM, the point of big firms is not how to fire people. The point is how to keep good people. And also coordination, monitoring, checking and so on, is very complicated. It never really works. How do I get my employees, the principal agent problem, how do I get my employees to act in my interest? I get them to act in my interest that they are so motivated as part of the team that they will automatically pursue what they understand to be the corporate interest. How do I do this strong motivation? Arkelov studied the US Army you know, people in the US Army, highly educated, very intelligent, risking their lives, top engineering degrees usually, these people have, and for money that is a joke. Have you ever seen where American lieutenants or majors live? I mean, most of us wouldn't want to live in an apartment like that. It is so simple. And yet, why do these highly intelligent people risk their existence, their lives, and work for that, because they're highly motivated, because they totally believe that the United States of America is the beacon of democracy, the keeper of world peace, and so on and so on. So they're very strongly motivated. If you're evil, you can say they're brainwashed, but you can also say they're strongly motivated. So what Akerlof says is we need this kind of motivation also in the big corporations, and big corporations perform the better the more they motivate their people. By the way, the big ICT companies did that very early on. Apple. Microsoft in the early days, classic example today is Samsung. So you strongly motivate people to work in this way. So Arkelov actually says, 
we need to look at Max Weber and the identification in classical PA with the position and that is what the private sector should learn. And you see the irony, the main economist in the late 90s, early 2000s says big corporations should learn from the state and the state says we should learn from big corporations at the same time. So there is a real irony here. A famous case study was done by people from Bocconi University in Milan, the leading Italian economics university, about the bonus payment at the UN Human Rights Commission. They introduced the bonus system, one of the first, and the Bocconi people studied it. How much did the bonus system influence performance? Answer, zero importance. The bonuses were totally wasted. Why? Well, there are various reasons. It was a very stupid example to take if you want to prove bonuses, because first of all, if you work for the UN Human Rights Division as a lawyer, you could make much more money in the private sector uh, as a top lawyer. And these are only top lawyers. So these are people who are not motivated by money anyway. But second, for the civil service sector, the UN pays a lot of money. So if you just give them one or two thousand dollars as a bonus, they don't really care. They would care more about an order or a decoration or getting an award. But two thousand dollars, it's nothing in Geneva. You can go for dinner twice. Well, not quite, but you know what I mean. It's just not important. Actually, that should come as no surprise to us. The most important early thinker of what we call public management is the creator of the theory of scientific management, Frederick Winslow Taylor, who in the early 1900s wrote a book and invented the concept of scientific management, measuring incentives, bonuses, and so on. And he says explicitly, this works the better the lower you go, but the top management cannot do that. You cannot motivate top management with monetary incentives, with performance pay and with benchmarks. A small footnote here, as many of you might know, the first great PA thinker who realized that you cannot motivate top civil servants with bonus systems and performance pay was the great Song Dynasty Chancellor and statement, uh, statesman Wang Xie who in the Wan Yun Shu, the memorandum of 10,000 words, explicitly describes that you cannot do too much performance review because you demotivate the good people and you motivate the bad people and you should only review three times after careful selection. So once again, we have an imperial Chinese invention here of this theory. Anyway, the older ones of you might remember a mobile phone brand called Nokia. Are we, are we old enough to remember Nokia? Okay. <laughs> These were great mobile phones. You could throw them out of the window and they would still work. Mokia is dead, totally dead. They don't say anything anymore, although Lumia is a nice one. But basically, be, why? Because Nokia never switched to smartphones. But we don't text anymore. We need smartphones. Everybody does. Why did Mo Nokia not go to smartphones? A really interesting case study. Because they were really like an NPM firm, everything was segmentized and compartmentalized, and nobody had the big picture. Nokia had a division on screens, a division on accus, a division on keyboards, a division on cover, a division on personnel, and they all improved their thing, but nobody looked at the machine from the entire perspective. And today, they are selling their mobile phone. You can buy it now, the mobile phone segment of Nokia. It's for sale. It's cheap. Nobody wants it. So, at that time when all of these things became clear, NPM wasn't dead, but I like to compare it to a snake whose head has cut off. So, there were no key thinkers anymore on NPM, but the snake still wiggled. So, in a lot of civil service reform implementations and so on, you still had NPM. How can I prove that this is correct? Well, you can, for instance, always tell what is the mood in our discipline, as well as in many disciplines, if you study the keynote addresses of our main conferences and the first articles in the main journals. Because that is where the public opinion of a discipline is displayed. And if you look at, from that time, 1995, all the keynote lectures at ASPA, APSA, NISPA, IAS, IASIA, RSPM, and so on, they all didn't assume NPM anymore, 
but they were either opposed to it or would say, well, I know it's unfashionable now, but outside of the countries, Anglo-Americans would still promote NPM, but inside not anymore. So, very important, the UNDP's uh, Human Development Report acknowledged that NPM was a total disaster, and even in 2002, the World Bank, who had pushed NPM more than any other international agency, said on their website, 2002, the problem with NPM is that it never worked. So, this is where the situation was. 2004, you know, Switzerland, the probably most successful country in the world, just before Singapore, they put everything to a direct vote, including PA reform. So Basel, D uh, Geneva, and then Dübendorf. Dübendorf sounds small, but this is the high-tech area around Zurich Airport. They put the NPM reforms to a public vote for the citizens, because everybody always said it's for the citizens. What did the citizens say? It's too expensive, no improvements of efficiency, effectiveness, or quality, accounting too difficult and bad for democracy. That's pretty bad, and they voted against it. If NPM is all of that, it means you want to sell food and you say, it looks bad, it stinks, it doesn't taste well, and it's dangerous for you. That's not much of an advertisement. So, once again, the awareness was different in different places, fears, and so on. So, state level understood it, international organizations. In local government, you still had NPM reforms. And the more you went from the center to the periphery, intellectually speaking, the more NPM was still there. Now, let's do a quick look from today's perspective in which countries NPM was successful, in which they still promote it today, and how, how this works from the perspective of 2013. So, if NPM was anywhere successful than in New Zealand, in Australia, and in Canada, there are a lot of people in New Zealand and in Canada who think it was not successful, and there are many people, also not a majority, who think it also in Australia, but these are the comparatively most successful NPM countries. Australia is the only country today that openly goes for NPM of the first world. Prominent countries with NPM but where it didn't work, especially the United States of America, England, these are the two countries where it came from, the Netherlands, and then finally a country that was very famous for NPM but didn't do it was Finland. Finland did a brilliant thing. They said at all conferences and so on, we are doing NPM, but they never really did it. And therefore, it worked. Now, if you look at this map, what do you see mainly? What you see is this is one group of countries. Namely, it is Great Britain and its former white colonies. Not only its former colonies, but its former white colonies, where the British colonialists didn't colonize the inhabitants, but killed them and sent their own people there. That is Australia, that is Canada, and the United States, and so on. So it's Anglo-America and its colonies. The second observation we make, these are all incredibly rich countries. So they could afford NPM. NPM doesn't save money, it costs money. But if you're that rich, if you have a lot of aluminum and bauxite in your earth and nobody lives there, like in Australia, you can afford a lot of mistakes. You just sell more aluminum to mainland China, and there you can afford a stupid civil service reform. You know. So. Actually, for me, that NPM was dead was clear when I had a dinner with the head of civil service reform from the Ministry of Finance in Finland in Helsinki. Because what he was saying to me is that, oh, you know, Wolfgang, NPM, we never followed NPM. We only used individual tools from NPM. And I was thinking, oh, no, that's not true. You never used tools. You were the biggest propagandist of NPM. But, you know, I'm a polite person, and he paid for the dinner, so I didn't say anything. But it was very interesting. The only place where at that point, we're talking mid-2000s, NPM was still prominent actually was, and this is important for this conference, was in the concept of good governance. Good governance, I want to emphasize, if you spell it with two large Gs, is not necessarily good. Good governance is an in invention largely by the international finance institutions, IMF and World Bank, and what they thought is good isn't good for the people, it's good for them. This is a very ideological bunch. 
And in the principles of good governance, classically perceived with two large Gs, a lot of NPM was in there. You know, efficiency and transparency in certain institutions and all of that stuff. So the typical NPM stuff. So NPM was dead, but it lived on within good governance without being acknowledged. The real end of NPM, many of us felt, is when in the spring, early summer, 2008, the New Zealanders had privatized their railroad. One of the first things you do under NPM is you privatize public infrastructure because you can put that into the market. And New Zealand, the number one harshest NPM country in the world, deprivatized the railroad system in the spring of 2008. And you know why? For two reasons. First, under private directorship, the service was bad, and second, it was too expensive. So exactly that. NPM means more costs, less effect. So, and so everybody was leaning back and saying, okay, goodbye NPM, and then comes the crash, and we are back to NPM. Not because NPM saves money, but because NPM looks as if it saves money. So, little question, why did NPM lose ground so quickly? Because it was really fast. Actually, if you look at that, paradigms usually take much longer to expire. NPM got dead very quickly. In economics, ideologies take much longer. Why did, in, did NPM and PA get unfashionable so fast? Well, it has something to do with the specificities of PA as a scholarly field. First, it's a heterogeneous field of scholarship. We don't have a PA methodology. We bother it from other areas, from political science. There are lawyers, there are managers, there are sociologists. There are a lot of people in PA. So it's not so rigid, and you can switch fairly quickly. The second one is we are actually a small field. PA is not even 5% of what economics is and not even 1% of what psychology is. We have a very small field. You cannot tell me who are the leading economists of our time. We know some famous ones with Nobel Prizes, Stiglitz mainly, or Amirata Sen or so, or, well, but there are also very neoliberal ones like Lucas, or, so we don't know who are the most famous economists. But we do know in PA who are the top people in our field. We are such a small field that we know exactly who our top stars are. Most famous PA scholar is Guy Peters from the University of Pittsburgh. Second most famous is Christopher Hood, the Gladstone Professor of Governance in the University of Oxford. Third one is Christopher Pollitt from the Catholic University of Leuven, and so on and so on. So we know precisely who our stars are. If the stars change, the little ones change as well. And at least since 2000, all these top people that I mentioned had become critical of NPM. And in our field, it makes a big discipline difference. Then there was what is called pre-NPM leftover existence, uh, resistance. That means those people who had never liked NPM because they were old-fashioned bureaucrats said, oh, very good, NPM is left so I can again put on my gray suit and sleep during the day. This is not a good thing, but realistically it's true. And third, uh, fourth, I'm sorry, NPM didn't work because of the reality connects. You know what political science is basically about. It's about whining about government. But it's not doing government. You don't study political science to do politics. Most politicians are not political scientists. Most political scientists never become politicians. Politicians, for instance, in America, are usually lawyers, not political scientists. But you study PA in order to become a bureaucrat. And if you are a PA professor like us, we have a direct impact on PA reform. And if we don't perform, if we give wrong advice about tax collection or police organization or something like that, we are losers. We need to perform. We have a direct, this is the biggest difference between Paul Sci and PA. PA must work. It's like engineering. If you construct a bad bridge, it falls down, you're not good. Political scientists never construct bridges. So in our field that NPM didn't work was a major problem because in the end, what the state people want is a working bureaucracy and not one that's supposed to look nice. So, what happened is, and now I'm only looking at one example for post-NPM. Let me make this very clear. This is one of the post-NPM paradigms that I want to emphasize because I find it very interesting, but it's not the only one. Mm, that's very important. So what I'm now saying is not it, but one solution. We looked again at Weberian PA, which NPM had really hated, Problematic level is because I mentioned NPM had presented a cliche, a caricature 
of Weberianism. And again, Max Weber didn't particularly like the model of PA. You know, they say that, you know, um, Marx said that he was not a Marxist, Luther said he was not a Lutheran, some people say Christ was not a Christian, Weber was not a Weberian. You know, sometimes people don't have the view that is named after them. But he just thought it was the most rational and efficient theory for his time. And this Weberianism actually got a major boost by a key publication by Professor Evans, again a Californian and one of the leading sociologists for our time, who in 1999 did a highly empirical study of 35 developing countries, and he linked economic growth and classical Weberian administration and found a very close match. That means, he would say, countries develop more, the more Weberian they are, especially, by the way, merit selection. That means if you get a job because you're good and not because you have a good uncle, that is one of the main indicators of economic growth. So, was the idea to go back to the ancien regime of Prussian-style bureaucracy? Now, that's unlikely. And of course, it's not so. Of course, there have been changes since the end of World War I, and there have been adaptations of the Weberian system. So we are not talking about the death of managerialism, but what happened in the PA discourse is that we say, and it's also something that I agree with, that NPM is dead as an overall ideology. That does not mean that there are not many very significant and good achievements of NPM. So we see NPM as a toolbox. Certain parts of NPM are really important, and it would be horrible to say no to them, to throw out the baby with the bathwater, just because NPM as an overall ideology is bad. So, what happened then is that Christopher Pollitt, whom I mentioned, and Gerd Buchert, the current president of IAS and the leading organizer of PA globally, I think, came up with a system they called the neo weberian State, or NWS, a specifically European model of contemporary good governance. By the way, you see here how good is spelled small, meaning it's really good and not what the World Bank says. So, Pollitt and Bookert said the European democracies such as Scandinavia and Northern Europe, who didn't implement full NPM, they were not behind, but they were actually ahead. What we need in the end is a basically Weberian system with all the good lessons of NPM learned. People who have this attitude, and this includes myself, by the way, personally say, you should take everything from NPM that you can prove numerically actually works. But it becomes an ideology if you adopt NPM solution if they don't even work. So, this, the good thing was that Pollitt and Bookert are the authors of the main textbook of public management reform, which I'm sure you know, the Bible as some people call it, called conveniently public management reform out at Oxford University Press, uh, now in its third edition, but it's the second edition in which they introduced the concept in 2004. It's a brilliant book, actually better than the third edition. Um, one of the reasons I don't like the third edition is because about the neo weberian state, I always used to refer to that, but in the third edition they refer to me, so I can't reform to this because then it is a loop of legitimization. Um, very, very briefly, since I have so little time, I'm already over the time, so I really need to hurry. Neo-elements, according to Pollitt and Booker, shift to citizen orientation, not via the market, but quality and service culture supplementation of representative democracy by direct citizens' input, including social media, Twitter, Facebook, and so on, results orientation rather than following procedure, and finally, the professionalization of public service from legal expert to professional manager focused on the needs of the citizen. So these are classical NPM things that work, that are good, that promote good governance, and that we really should do. But, paired to that, but, 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 Weberian elements, Reaffirmation of the role of the state as the main facilitator of solution, representative democracy, legitimating element within the state, administrative law as the basis. Outside of administrative law, the state cannot be challenged. And finally, the idea of a public service with a distinctive status. One of the main ideas of NPM, as you might remember, was that you can just hire people in and out of the civil service. You just advertise any position. You don't have a civil service cadre. This was a total disaster. Career civil service is the best. 
unfortunately. But you, you know that Winston Churchill called democracy the worst form of government except all others. And the same thing is with career civil service. It's the worst form of bureaucracy except all others. Then comes the crisis. We thought we were moving into a new barbarian state. Off it goes because the new barbarian state is expensive. The funny thing though is that NPM has the same language as the way of thinking that led to the current crisis. NPM, remember, is a carryover of business and economics theories into the public sector. These business and economics theories come from the assumption that business is where it's at, that the economy is the model for everything. But the economy, the overdoing of the economy, is what ruined the world for the global crisis, that we run too strong after the economy. And this is why many people say that NPM is the PA of the crisis. It's the equivalent. And there is this nice adapted cartoon from the New Yorker where this little couple says, let me get this straight. You want to offer us advice on PA reform? That means we should learn from the ruined banking and business sector in PA. This is the one place you can't learn anything from. Now, two things, global financial crisis. First, nobody has money anymore. Everybody's broke. Second, though, never has the state been so active and prominent also in the economy as after the crisis. Many, many Western banks are more or less state-owned. That leads to two features. First, public debt. Second, vital PA competence. But this leads to two different views of how public management reform should now happen. Public debt wants less state. Vital PI competence means more state, better and even better paid bureaucrats, let's say Singapore style. So, but if you want to go further away from the state, you go back to NPM. And if you want to have more qualified civil servants, you go back to the new Iranian state. So what do we have today? That's a problem. That is a problem for our discipline. If somebody outside of our discipline asks us, what is your current discipline? What is your view? What is your paradigm? We have to say, I'm sorry, we don't know. And it's embarrassing. It's like if you ask a physicist, if I lift this thing up, will it fall down or not? And he says, well, I don't know. <laughs> we have different views. It's not nice. But in PA, we have that. We don't really know. Let me quickly sum it up, just typologically speaking. In the beginning until the 1970s, everybody was barbarian. There was nobody else. Then comes NPM, and almost everybody was NPM, but some people stayed barbarian. And then, after the big break around 2000, 2005, we have the neo barbarian state, which is barbarianism with the lessons from NPM learned. We have what's called the new public governance, which is NPM with the lessons from barbarianism learned. Then, we have the new NPM guys who are into NPM because of the crisis, and we have the old NPM guys who never believed that NPM died. And of course, as you see, there is still space. We still have the old barbarians who never changed their mind at all. These are the people who, since 1949, wear the same suit, and occasionally it gets into fashion again. Right? By the way, this is a simplified matrix. We have even more than these five. As I mentioned on this slide in the beginning, uh, value governance, for instance, and so on and so on, but more or less you can put them in there. I should very briefly say that also, because these are the two most important, NWS is very implementation-based, it's PA, how, whereas the new public governance is policy-based. What policy do we have? But still, this gives you the view of our discipline, and where are we going? Well, I don't know it either. It is not legitimate to say that you know where things are going, because we really don't know. And so we have muddy waters through which we need to walk. This is actually already it, but if I can have five more minutes to really finish it, let me, let me say, because this is interesting in these kind of research conferences for colleagues, what I would now say is I briefly mention what I think is the four most important publications on this NPM question from this year. So the very fresh publications, partially even in press. Maybe that's of some interest to you. So the first essay, um, this um, is by Tony Verheyen, a UNDP officer, 
who is now stationed in Sarajevo. He's not even published it yet, but gives this lecture at a lot of conferences. One of the big theorists in the second world of NPM. And he has an interesting study in which he says that as soon as countries get problems, they go back to barbarianism. NPM is a fashion for rich people. And if you have a lot of money, you can afford it. And then you do it. In crisis, you say you do NPM again, but you really don't. You go back to solidity. I mentioned that the biggest international promoter of NPM was the World Bank. Uh, Matt Andrews, new associate professor of governance at Harvard University's Kennedy School of Governance, wrote a brilliant book with uh, Oxford University Press this year in which he talks about the governance reforms by the World Bank. And this is an old World Bank guy. And he comes to the statistical results, which most of us in development economics knew, but popular it wasn't so well known, is that less than 50% of all the money spent by the World Bank on government reform has positive results. In other words, more than half doesn't work. In other words, meanly put, if you want to do a good thing about your country, don't do what the World Bank says, ever. Take their money, lie about what you're doing, and don't do their reforms, because that ruins your country. And these reforms tend to be NPM reforms. It's a very good book, very much worth it. Then I mentioned a research project named COCOPS. This is one of the big, large-scale EU-financed research projects. Our university is also in it. I'm also on the management board. But the main manager is Stephen van der Waale, the young star at Erasmus University in Rotterdam, basically a pro-NPM guy. There you can see the impact of NPM reforms, uh, or the impact of the global crisis on NPM reforms today. And in this, Van der Waale has an essay on NPM-based public delivery, public service delivery reforms in England. And the people were asked, very empirical, very classical, very NPM. And the result is citizens think that as soon as you have NPM reforms, the quality of public service delivery goes down. But the point was it should go up. My favorite essay this year, however, has been from the great gentleman that I mentioned before, Christopher Hood, the Gladstone Professor of Government in the University of Oxford. That's about the best job you can get in Europe if you're a PA scholar or a political scientist. It's our best job. Why is Christopher uh, Hood also so interesting? Well, as you might know, Christopher Hood came up with the word NPM. He coined the term originally. And he wrote an essay early this year, published, in which he traces how much money NPM saved in uh, early Thatcher Britain. That means where it really started. This is where NPM, if ever, should have worked. It should have worked in the 80s in Britain. And what turns out is it was more expensive than classical, old-fashioned administration before. Great article. If you haven't read it, do. Now, very quickly put. Why do people today still promote NPM? If this is all so clear, why do you have these NPM fans? Hmm. If we look at the classical typology of why we have public management reforms, first reason is fashion. We reform PA because everybody else reforms PA. And if you don't reform PA and you go to an international conference, you don't look cool. But we all want to look cool, so we reform the PA. It's true. Second is ideology. Ideology is different. It's not to look cool, but because you believe that the world is done in a way. You hate the state, you want small PA. You love the state, you want big PA. Third, corruption. Why I privatize the firm is not because it's good for the people, but because I want my nephew to be the executive director of the firm. And it happens a lot. And only the third one is problem solving, and that is what we always think is the main point, but it's not. From a study of Central and Eastern Europe, we know that there are two more reasons of PA reform. The first is what you call modernist positioning. That means towards other countries, I want to look good. You need to develop country profiles. And the third one is tactics. You know, it's very difficult to fire bureaucrats in bureaucratic systems. Where you think you want to fire them to adopt NPM gives you an objective looking way of how to evaluate all these nephews and korupniks and fire them. So you don't believe in NPM, but you have a way to fire people you don't like. So from 2013, we can say there are three reasons why people still promote NPM, maybe four. First, ideology. You hate the state. Never mind whether it works or not. Down with the state. Second, corruption. 
Third, tactics. You believe in reform and no matter what, you want to ni have a nice way of how to do it. And then of course there's pure ignorance. You haven't read anything and still think that NPM works. And sometimes at conferences you meet people who say, yeah, yeah, NPM, because they haven't been reading journals. Of these four, the only decent one is tactics. And I understand tactics. You know, I'm on a sabbatical now. First part of my sabbatical, I, I spent in mainland China, in Beijing as a professor at the Central University of Finance and Economics. And then the middle part, before coming to Taiwan, I was in Hyderabad, the center of PA of India. Now, India has the biggest bureaucracy in the world. In fact, the Indian railroad system is the biggest bureaucratic institution in the universe. India is totally pushing NPM. Indians are very brilliant people, very often educated at the top universities in the world. Why do the Indians push NPM? Because they tell me it's the only way how we can break up this iron hard traditional British civil service. So we know NPM doesn't work, but it gives us a rhetorical tool to change something. Now, it would be mean to say that, well, in India, no, no change ever works, so never mind what they're saying, but you understand why they're trying. So, this is a legitimate view. How is it in Taiwan? I'm not a Taiwan expert. I find it very interesting. Why do I have this picture here of the Gugong, by the way? Because how is the Gugong called in English? National Palace Museum, or abbreviated? NPM. <laughs> The website is NPM all the time. So if I link any exhibition of the NPM, it's one of the first places I go when I go to Taiwan. This is an absolute dream place, as you might know, for anyone interested in classical Chinese. And then you say, I'm visiting the NPM. And people, Why are you doing that? You know, so <laughs> this, is, this is an interesting thing. But anyway, the lesson drawing for Taiwan, I really leave to you. And I'll be interested to learn about it. I have some very strong views about NPM in mainland China, but all together, as my very last point, and it's really my last slide, I'm sorry it took so long, the metaphor about trying to improve the government through NPM is this. It would be nice if NPM works. It was a great idea. The people in the late 70s didn't do NPM because they were evil, but because they really tried to have a state that costs less and works more. They had very good motivations. But we have to empirically say it didn't work. It would be nice, but it doesn't. The metaphor that we very often use for this is there is a story of a drunk person who lost his car keys, and now he's looking for them under a street lamp. And somebody comes by and says, is this where you lost your keys? And he says, no, I lost my keys somewhere else, but here it's so light. And that is the same with NPM. You don't find the answer in NPM, even if the reform agenda is a positive one. No one doubts that many systems need change and need reform, but NPM as such is not the answer. Individual achievements, insights, and reform tools of NPM are certainly helpful. Thank you much for your attention. <laughs>